Um, hi, everybody, and thanks very much for that warm welcome, uh, David. Uh, David and I got to know each other, and, and Julian also, in the, the first uh, EcoCity Food Summit, which was held at Donkey Wheel House in Burke Street uh, back in February 2013. And it's exciting that this space has uh, been building since then and evolving and changing. And it's particularly exciting, as I think uh, David said in his opening remarks, that we're now um, taking these kinds of events uh, outside the city. Uh, I think it's really important to uh, to really start building the connections um, in, a, in a deep and engaged way in communities around Melbourne. And it's great that Hume are uh, providing such leadership in this space. And it's an honour and privilege for me to be here as the invited guest of the City of Hume. And thank you very much for the invitation. Um, what I've come to understand in terms of my work in this space over the last several years is that a lot of it is about the telling of stories. And that's, I guess, what we've been doing around tables in the, uh, in the World Cafe just finished. And the key word that keeps coming back to me uh, time and time again is uh, connection and connectedness around food. And that's already been mentioned um, by the mayor and by Craig Ondaatje in their remarks. And just before I um, hop into this, um, into this little presentation I'm going to share with you, I'd just like to get a sense um, of, of who's in the room and how we are connected uh, around food. So I'm going to invite you to stand uh, if you are a commercial producer of food, a farmer or a food grower. Wow, so thank you for coming. Um, so that's actually quite representative. We might have about 70 people in the room. Um, the percentage of farmers and commercial food growers in Australia today is less than 2%. We really need to care for these people. They are actually doing an amazing job in uh, feeding us. Uh, and we forget that at our peril. There's a great saying, we talked about Facebook and social media. There's a, a couple of little great slogans on Facebook uh, one I like in particular is called, keep your friends close, but keep your farmer closer. And I think that really speaks to the need to really care and value our food producers, which is something uh, that we haven't done very well as a culture and society over the last uh, 40 or 50 years with the, the great sort of globalisation of the food system. But just taking that a little bit further, uh, please stand if you know personally a farmer or a food grower, commercial producer. Okay, so that's about half of you. So getting a bit of a sense of a sort of like a stronger connection, and that's what we'd expect to see, I guess, in a, in a very engaged um, uh, room of such as this. Sit down, please. Um, now stand up if you grow or raise some of your own food. Uh, herbs, chickens. Right, so that's pretty much everyone. And, and also stand up, stay standing, those people. And if you're not standing, but you know somebody who's growing or raising some of your own food, would you also stand up? A friend or a family member or somebody in your street, a neighbour? Okay, so nearly everybody is connected now through personally growing or raising food and survey research shows that half of Australians now are growing or raising some of our own food and that's growing very rapidly. That number has increased by about 20% in the last couple of years, which is a really interesting phenomenon. And now finally, uh, I'd invite you to stand if you eat food each day. <laughs> oh, not everyone's standing. We have some breatharians in the audience. <laughs> Okay, um, thanks very much. Just please, please stand for a minute. Please keep standing for a minute. I just wanted to, I woke up at five o'clock this morning thinking about this and uh, how I was going to frame my remarks to you. And I just uh, wanted to share with you my thoughts. Um, and it's this, that we're all connected through food. And at one level that sounds trite and obvious, but if we reflect on it, it's incredibly powerful. So that connection means that healthy soils support healthy plants and animals. Healthy food creates healthy people. Healthy people build healthy communities. And healthy communities cultivate an ethic of care for all their members and stewardship of their land and resources. They, we, are the foundation for the fairer and better world that we all want to see. It begins with a deep recognition of our fundamental interdependence and interconnectedness through food. So every one of you here today has a vital role to play in co-creating that better world. And that's the opportunity that today presents. That's why for me it's an inspiration to be here with you and I thank you all for coming. Thank you very much. Okay, so now, so it's just clicking, it's just the clicker, yep. All right, so what I'm going to do now, the next sort of like 10 minutes or so, is just share some pictures. Um, my main objective with this is really to sort of, you know, to seed some inspiration, some uh, exciting stories and projects of things happening in other parts of the world and also around Melbourne. Um, there's going to be a bit of text, a bit of content in terms of concepts and how this area is framed because it's very important to sort of be solidly uh, based in understanding 
Uh, the overall context in which we're discussing food systems, human right to food, food security, those kinds of co um, concepts. The reality in Hume and what's actually taking place in this part of Melbourne. Uh, what it means in terms of a food policy development. And then I'll be finish finishing with some inspiration to uh, keep the rest of the day. But I wanted to start with this, um, this great book, um, which I'd thoroughly recommend to anybody who's interested in this uh, space, particularly if you come from a, a food bank or a food rescue organisation. Is there anybody here from the emergency food sector? Anybody from a food bank or...? Okay. Um, particularly for you guys, this is a fantastic inspirational read and it's uh, a story of transformation. Um, the author, Nick Saul, uh, didn't come from a food background when he started as the director of the STOP uh, food bank in Toronto in 1998. He came from a community development, community organising background. And really this is a, it's an autobiography in many ways of his own journey of transformation. Um, but it's the story of the transformation of what was a food bank in the traditional charity model of handing out, um, you know, food that would otherwise be wasted, uh, food that's of, you know, low nutritional value or lower quality value to uh, people in real need. And building on that to build a, a model of empowerment uh, and actually uh, finding ways that, that that model can be transformed to become what he calls a community food centre, a hub for food growing, for food literacy for children, um, for affordable food distribution through farmers markets, through healthy food cafes, uh, through providing food growing spaces for uh, members of different cultural communities to grow foods that they actually want to eat. Um, and uh, it's, it's become a real draw card for the whole city of Toronto. Um, and it started off with uh, a small, uh, one person's vision at the late 1990s to transform a, a fairly um, uh, hard up, run down food bank into something quite remarkable. Um, so, and what is his, his, his whole starting point was this, that access to good food is a basic human right. Um, that it's not something that, you know, it's not a case of beggars can't be choosers, which is one of the things that, one of the points he makes constantly uh, in the book, but that everybody, regardless of their circumstances or income, deserves and has the right to have the best possible food available. And we're seeing in our society and across the world a very clear division uh, into what we might call rich eaters and poor eaters, where there are, you know, a small segment of our society has access to, to good, organic, fresh food, but lots and lots of people don't. And that's, that outrages him and that's his motivation all through this story and that's what he's trying to change. And it's a powerful story of change. Um, so this is... Uh, um, this was 10 years in the making. This is called the Green Barn. And this has been the transformation from a, you know, a food bank handing out um, uh, processed, uh, low nutrient quality food into a nursery, into a farmer's market, into a, a food literacy centre for young children, into a healthy beginning centre for pregnant women, uh, into community kitchens. So many diverse things happening from one space, which was a, a disused uh, industrial building that ha used to house trams uh, in the centre of Toronto. So it's a, a story of, of a vision, of change, of mobilising resources and bringing people together, bringing a community together around food. Um, and this is just another little example of some of the things that he's doing. Sorry, I, I, whoops. Oh, sorry, I'm having trouble. You can't see the title there, but the title there is actually Yimbies. I'm sure everyone's heard of Nimbies. Not in my backyard. Well, in Toronto, they've got Yimbies, which is yes in my backyard. So this is matching up uh, people who've got uh, growing spaces that they don't have time to cultivate uh, with people who don't have access to land but want to grow food. Um, and it's uh, a really successful dimension of the, the stop and the green barn. Um, so this is where we get into some concepts. Um, everybody's probably heard of food security, but we've done some surveys ourselves which suggest that probably about four-fifths of Australians can't actually um, articulate clearly what food security actually means. And that's hardly surprising when you look at that top definition from the Food and Agricultural Organisation, it is a bit of a mouthful. Um, and it looks like a, you know, it looks like a, a great concept, but uh, what it doesn't do is actually look at what the conditions are of production for the farmers, who actually controls different parts of the food system, where the food comes from. It's very much, it's reducing this question to really a question of nutritional value of the food without looking at broader systemic issues. Um, and what's happened in Australia and in other parts of the world is that food security has been reduced to a, a pure question of production. So it's said in that Australia, we are food secure because we export two thirds of what we produce. 
but we know that's not true because food banks across Australia are experiencing an incredibly strong demand for their services. Food Bank Australia, in fact, documented that they served just under 8 million meals, 8 million emergency food meals in 2004. By 2013, that had risen to nearly 40 million emergency food meals. With the latest changes in uh, budgets and changes to the welfare benefit system, that's expected to double again by 2017. So we'll go from 2004, about 8 million emergency food meals, to nearly 80 million by 2017, which is really quite a shocking indictment on a country as rich as Australia that that many people are going to be dependent on emergency food aid. So uh, in my research, I contrast food security with the human right to food. And this is a recent definition uh, of the human right to food provided by the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the right to food, Olivia de Schutter. And it's, for me, it's a much richer holistic concept that really gets to a deep understanding of what we're talking about when we think of food and agriculture as a whole system. So the key concepts really in that, in that middle definition are availability, which looks at the question of production and critically the livelihood conditions for small farmers. It sounds ironic and paradoxical, but most of the one billion hungry people in the world are actually food growers themselves, small farmers or agricultural workers. Uh, questions of accessibility, which looks at questions of income and social security systems and welfare benefits and, and jobs. Uh, adequacy, which touches on questions of health and culture. And then sustainability, which looks at actually creating and designing a food system that can feed not only this generation that lives today, but future generations going into the future. So questions of care for our environment and natural resources. Um, this is the man himself, Olivier de Schutter, uh, who's spent the last six years travelling the world uh, investigating in detail food systems and questions of the human right to food and its enjoyment or otherwise uh, in, in many contexts. Um, and what he's concluded there is that we have to move away from this productivist paradigm. Remember I said about food security, the focus is all about production. More, more, more. More volumes, more exports, more commodities. His conclusion, having lived this and breathed this every day for the last six years, is we need a total new paradigm. We need a new way of thinking about this whole area. And it has to be foregrounding and prioritising health, well-being, resilience and sustainability. Um, a, 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 a stat that's often trotted out is that the world must produce 70% more food or double its food production to feed a growing population by 2050. Some of you have probably heard that. To me, that doesn't make sense when you look at the fact that as much as 40% of everything that's produced is wasted. One of the key themes for today is waste, and it's absolutely critical to the design of a sustainable and fair food system. Um, I don't know if you can see that middle uh, stat. That comes from uh, a British author called Tristram Stewart. This is just about water, which shows that the water, the irrigation water used to grow food that today that's wasted would be enough to fulfill the domestic needs of nine billion people. So that when you hear talk about how efficient our food system is, remember facts like that. All right, so talking about human rights, um, it's great to be in Hume because Hume has shown leadership in this area for a long time. It's the first council in Melbourne to adopt a human rights charter back in the year 2000. And this is the, the social, charter, social justice charter, um, which features very prominently as part of that broader understanding of human rights. And that quote at the front um, is straight from the Hume Social Justice Charter. Uh, there are central components, so it's not just about um, you know, high-standing statements of, of principle, but it's really about concrete actions and being accountable, the council being accountable to the community and showing leadership in this area. Um, so those are some of the, that's the, the definition uh, as it's been articulated in Hume about what uh, social justice actually means. And this is another point that uh, Nick Saul makes in his book, The Stop, that when we talk about fair food and local food, it's not just about people eating well and having access to food, but people being empowered to be, uh, participate in their societies and fulfil their roles as citizens, to really give meaning to democracy. And to me, that's really the, the core of what this uh, social justice charter is about. Um, so then looking at the context in Hume, and this is uh, research that the council has done. Um, this is just a little snapshot. There's uh, much more detail than that. Um, but uh, the clear message that comes through those stats is that there's a real uh, issue here in terms of access to good, healthy, fresh food for quite a significant proportion of the uh, council's residents. And in terms of any food policy or action strategies, I think that really needs to be foregrounded as a very high priority. And we look there at the, the bottom couple of bullet points in terms of 
the cost of the healthy food basket. Um, my reading of the stats is about 17% of the median weekly income, but for low income households, uh, that's a third of their weekly income must be spent on food if they want to eat well, which is a very large chunk of, um, of, a, of a fixed income. And as I mentioned before, uh, the demand for emergency food relief is rising sharply in Hume as in elsewhere across Victoria. And there's also an important issue about the access of culturally appropriate foods for members of what is a very culturally diverse community. Um, so that's the context. Uh, in terms of what's actually happening, these, this is a bit of a snapshot of some great things that are happening in Hume with uh, school kitchen gardens, community gardens, uh, community kitchens that picks up on the theme of, of growing and eating and making. Uh, the, the Jamie Oliver Mobile Ministry of Food um, worked with 500 people in over five weeks uh, in terms of building capacity around healthy cooking. Uh, we have the, um, the Bright Herb Farm and Plants Nursery, which is uh, adorning all the tables here today, some of the, the wonderful products of that social enterprise. Um, there's farmers markets in Craigieburn and Sunbury, the Sunbury Organic Food Co-op, um, and then this network of emergency food relief agencies. So there's real uh, infrastructure and foundation in Hume already on which to build on in terms of uh, opening our imaginations for designing a fair and sustainable food future for Hume. So these are just some uh, reflections that came to me as I was uh, preparing my remarks for today in terms of looking at what food policies elsewhere contain and what might uh, be contained for Hume. Uh, and this looks really highlights the central role of local government, uh, uh, why local government needs to be a leader and facilitator in this space because food touches across so many areas of our society, across uh, planning, uh, across agribusiness uh, and extension services to support the uh, 350 rural properties, around 350 rural properties that still exist. This is a, a peri-urban area. Uh, there are still um, uh, uh, commercial farmers in Hume, but they are struggling. They need uh, support. Uh, questions of parks and open space in terms of um, uh, productive areas, not just people growing food in their own back gardens, but uh, people growing food in public spaces. Uh, education and skill sharing is um, absolutely critical and that's a, a fundamental role of urban agriculture and, and community gardening. Uh, and the broader question of uh, food security and how the, uh, the beginnings of uh, urban agriculture movement and community gardens can actually be expanded. Um, uh, colleagues were just saying that currently there's about 200 members of the five um, community gardens in Hume. How can that membership be expanded? How can those community gardens uh, work with commercial producers to really make a big difference to those, uh, that 30% of the Hume population that is actually experiencing difficulty in accessing good and healthy food? All right, so now let's talk about some uh, examples of what's happening elsewhere, what other people have been doing. Um, this uh, is some work that I was involved in um, ongoing over the last few years that was really a response to the, uh, the last Australian government's uh, national food plan, which <clears throat> uh, was very much in that productivist paradigm. Its, its main targets were about uh, raising levels of productivity on Austra in Australian agriculture and boosting our exports. Uh, so we looked to what had been done elsewhere, to Canada in particular, with the People's Food Policy Project and said, we need to be having a different conversation in Australia around this area. It's not just about treating food as another sector of the economy and as another economy uh, commodity, but rather prioritising health and welfare and fairness front and centre. So that's what uh, that document is about. Um, uh, in terms of taking this forward, uh, again looking to uh, Canada as um, a source of inspiration in the province of Ontario last year, they passed a local food act, uh, which did a whole range of things. Um, <clears throat> including setting goals and targets for local food purchases. So that again looks at the critical role of the public sector and local governments in particular uh, and state governments <clears throat> to use its purchasing power as a, as a contractor of food to send signals to food producers uh, that they are valued and that local food will be prioritised in the purchasing decisions of bodies like councils and health institutions. Um, uh, it decrees an annual local food week to bring people together to shine a spotlight uh, on this area and, and celebrate initiatives uh, and people that are working in this area and also is supported by a $30 million local food fund which supports the initiatives of uh, community gardens, of farmers markets, of food hubs, of community food kitchens, of farmers who want to diversify on their uh, land. Sorry, I'm just getting the uh, wind up. I've got to keep 
to move, I'll move through because there's all pictures now, so I'll move through quickly, I promise. Um, so we're trying to take that forward in Victoria. We've started a, a campaign for a local food act, uh, picking up on the precedent in Ontario, making some demands. Unfortunately, the, the MPs walked out the door and can't hear this, but uh, if you do one thing today, I'd encourage you to go to change.org and search for the local food act for Victoria and sign the petition and share that with your friends. Um, because you know, we think if they can do it in Canada, why can't they do it here? Why can't we have a local food act to say that this is supported and valued in Australia? in Victoria. Um, these are examples around Melbourne in particular, so I'll just mention them quite quickly. 3,000 acres, um, a social enterprise that is mapping all the urban um, land in and around Melbourne that is available for food production and matching vacant space up with people who want to grow food. It's a great initiative, again inspired by a project in New York called 596 Acres. Um, Permablitz Melbourne, uh, has anybody heard of Permablitz, been involved in the Permablitz? Yep. Um, so this is bringing people together to do makeovers, to make edible gardens in people's backyards. Um, great project. They've done nearly 160 since 2006, which is fantastic. But if you think that's great, um, the Victory Garden Initiative in Milwaukee, um, which has been going for a number of years, they have a fortnight each year in spring where they do over 500 um, blitzes. 500 edible gardens are built each year in Milwaukee uh, to expand the urban food system. Um, I had a little other tab, which I'm not sure if I can get to. Is there another? Just very quickly, just because it's a great slogan. Let's start on the safari. The other, the other tab for the Victory Gardens Initiative, Julian, if that's possible. Yep, that's it up there. Yep. Um, can people see that? This is a grassroots movement, move grass, grow food. To me, that says it all. I love it. Okay, thanks. Let's go back to the present. Sorry about that. I, I've probably confused things immensely by doing that. Okay. All right. Okay. So just quicking. I'll move quickly uh, on if I can get that to go again. Yeah. All right. Cool. Um, if anybody ever goes to Swanson Street, 252 Swanson Street, Curtin House, um, there's a, I think it's Australia's first rooftop garden. Um, great project. Um, this guy, Richard Thomas, the worm lover, um, is based in Yarraville. Uh, his whole thing is about worms and their role in, uh, in food systems. So there's a rooftop cinema, a Mexican restaurant called Mesa Verde. They've got 30 square metres of wicking bed gardens and it's a closed, loose, closed, closed loop system where the organic waste from the restaurant, the coffee grounds, goes into about half a dozen worm bins and the worms do their thing and that all goes into the wicking beds and pumps out fantastic herbs and veggies for the restaurant. It's, um, it's exciting to see and it'd be great to see more of that happening. Um, this guy, Angelo Iliades, is in Preston. If anybody has a chance to visit his, ooh, visit his garden, um, it's a fantastic experience. 80 square metres, um, he's producing or yielding now 350 kilos per year and his whole thing was to say if anybody tells you permaculture can't be productive look at what I'm doing 30 different types of uh, fruit trees 20 different types of berry vines uh, only been going about four years already over 300 kilos per year he's harvesting from his back garden and that's being taken out in partnership with the city of Darabin into All Nations Park to put in place a food forest um, in a public garden in Melbourne will be a first for Australia a very exciting initiative um, Tammy, uh, I think, is going to speak shortly, so I won't say too much about her other than uh, what her and her family have done is remarkable as new farmers, a, a breed of new young farmers in Australia, to be on 60 acres and to actually make that viable is a remarkable achievement. Um, over 70% of Australian farmers depend on off-farm income, um, so their model is exciting and innovative and um, it's an inspiration for lots of people. Um, Fair Food Week, um, again, uh, this, is a, this is picking up on what they did in Ontario, but we actually did it before Ontario because we did this for the first time last year in August. This time it's going to be in October. It's a nationwide event to celebrate and educate and shine the spotlight right around the country on what everybody is doing in the local and fair and healthy food space. Um, fairfoodweek.org.au is a website. It's self-organising. Um, uh, Fair Food Sunbury and City of Humour involved in this, which is exciting. Um, so please think about that. Um, 
The Food Alliance is working on, with local governments um, around Melbourne and beyond on a regional food network because there's so many councils now that are active in this space. So bringing councils together in a community of practice to share understandings and support each other in the development of food policies. Uh, we're also looking at a food charter as a, uh, a strategic document to actually build levels of shared understanding and language um, around this area. And just to end, on a call to action, this is not a call to arms in the literal sense of course, but a metaphorical call to arms. Um, I don't know if anybody speaks Spanish here, but those words mean let's be realists, let's understand the reality in which we live in and our social context, but let's also be dreamers. Soñemos lo imposible means let's dream the impossible. Let's open our minds, let's think big, let's open our imaginations and really work together to create the world we want to live in. Thank you very much.